I'm more than happy to open the third uh, seminar of the cycle entitled Rethinking Psychoanalysis in Central Europe, uh, Interdisciplinary and Transnational Perspective, organized by CEFRES in Prague, and uh, with Aurore Bem uh, at Sorbonne University and the Institute of Polish Culture uh, at the University of Warsaw. Um, and today I have a great, great uh, honor to welcome Professor Peter Rudnitsky. Uh, Peter, first of all, thank you for accepting uh, Sefers' invitation and for taking part in this project. It will be my pleasure. Our third seminar will be devoted to your recently published book uh, entitled Mutual Analysis for NC7. Uh, and the Origins of Trauma Theory, um, published in 2022. And this session will have a form of, uh, of conversation interview. And in the last part uh, of the meeting, we will invite uh, all of you to, to join uh, our discussion. So uh, my first question uh, will be related to your uh, discovery of Ferenczi. Um, in reading psychoanalysis, Freud Rank Ferenczi, you wrote a uh, quote, for those who have come under its spell, the history of psychoanalysis is a subject of inexhaustible fascination, uh, end quote. I would like to begin our conversation with the following question. What brought you, brought you to study Ferenczi? Do you remember maybe the first time you came across uh, his works? And more importantly, do you recollect the first time you read um, the uh, clinical diary of his? Thank, thank you for that question and for reading that sentence about how the history of psychoanalysis casts a spell on those of us who are drawn to this work. Um, I think my, my first book, which I published in 1987, was called Freud and Oedipus. And as an undergraduate student at Columbia, I read Freud and was fortunate to have classes taught by psychoanalysts not only on Freud, but on the development of psychoanalytic theory after Freud. And I think for us to, to read Freud, or really any writer, but Freud especially, we develop a certain transference to Freud, or we develop a sense of him as a person, because so much of his writing is autobiographical or confessional in, in very complicated ways. But in that book, I was really adopting a perspective on Freud Quite, quite sincerely that you could call a classical perspective, sort of Ernest Jones and, and so forth and so on, taking Freud's narrative of his life at face value in his own terms, although of course there's always the, the biographical determinants of his thought that I was interested in from the beginning. Um, but it then became a question for me of where does psychoanalysis go after Freud? Freud died in 1939, obviously, his contribution is fundamental, um, but if we're only annotating Freud and, and thinking in the terms that he gave us, we, it, is, it is not a living profession. And for me, it was really the discovery of Winnicott, the reading of Winnicott's playing in reality uh, that had a transformative effect. This would have still been in the 80s, um, that I had a sense of this is where I, I think there's a future in my own understanding of psychoanalysis along this line, that, that I had already, as a graduate student at Yale, I, I had studied Lacan, had the privilege of meeting Lacan in a course taught by Shoshana Feldman. Derrida was coming to Yale. The postmodernist trends were ones that I was very much exposed to as a graduate student, especially. Uh, and while I felt it was valuable, you know, there, there was much to learn from postmodernism, it was not the path that I felt I wanted to follow. It never resonated with me in the way that it did for many others. Likewise, the tradition of ego psychology, Hartman, Anna Freud, et cetera, seemed to me really to tinker around the edges of Freud, not, not to offer a rethinking of, of the fundamental assumptions. And it was really Winnicott's work that, that was both inspiring and, and you know, challenging to me that, that, that led me in this direction to my 1991 book called The Psychoanalytic Vocation, Ronk Winnicott and the Legacy of Freud. And, and it was Ronk, really. The, the Ronk papers are at the Columbia University Library. Um, I edited an early, an, an edition of American Imago, an issue of American Imago on the centenary of Ronk's birth. And I kind of came to Ronk uh, before Ferency. <laughs> 
And, and I made an argument that we could see Ronk as the first object relation psychoanalyst. Um, he, he wrote a paper, uh, gave a lecture on the genesis of the object relation. Um, so that, that was in 1991. And, and at that sort of, but in 1990 to 91, I believe if I, if I remember correctly, I, I spent a year in Hungary uh, at Janusz Pannonius University in Pécs that I'm sure Monica knows well and maybe some of the rest of you, you do. Uh, Anta Bokai is a very close friend of mine and a general editor of the uh, Ferenczi Network Edition project that Agnes is participating in as a volume editor. Um, the, the collection by uh, Aaron and Harris, The Legacy of Ferenczi, I, I think was published, was it in 91 or something? Um, or 93 maybe more accurately. Um, and the clinical diary what you asked me about um, was published first in um, French and English, and then only in 88, I believe, in German. And I did read it in German uh, shortly after it was published. You know, so, so, so I understood the importance of the diary, but I was not sort of present uh, at the beginning with the volume that Harris uh, and Aaron did. But when I spent a year in Hungary, I, of course, had the opportunity to, to be more immersed in the culture of Hungarian psychoanalysis generally, to meet many of the analysts, uh, and, and to be introduced in greater depth to Ferenczi. And so it, over time, gradually, in the 1996, I think, Agnes, you mentioned, uh, I, I co-edited with, with Antal and Patricia Jean-Pierre Deutsch what was really the second collection of essays on Ferenczi. Ferenczi's turn in psychoanalysis. <clears throat> and I intended the title of that work to have a kind of double meaning um, that Ferenczi makes a, a turn in psychoanalytic thought in a new direction, but it was also his time, his moment uh, for, for, for rediscovery. And so I kind of got on the Ferenczi bandwagon <clears throat> uh, by 1996 and, and gradually, um, he became increasingly important. And while I still think Ronk is important, uh, he became less central in my thinking. Um, I found the, the work of Ronk's final phase <clears throat> um, after he, he split with Freud, um, less valuable to be perfectly honest. Uh, you, you have the, 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 the sort of committed Ronkian people who, who really see Ronk's later work as the crucial work. Jim Lieberman's biography, Acts of Will, uh, is a great biography. Um, but he, you know, he embraced the later Ronk. Um, also, Robert Kramer in, in, in Budapest, who is a committed Ronkian, esteems the latest, you know, the later work um, after the break with Freud more, you know, convincing. I, I, I never found the later work of Ronk to be that profound that he throws away the concept of the unconscious, basically, in my view. Um, and what I felt was so crucial about Ferenczi was that he offers a model of psychoanalytic identity that is not Freudian. And, and, and therefore, even though he went into an internal exile, as we know, he, he was estranged in many important ways from Freud, but he did not have to succumb to the choice between either becoming a, a loyal disciple or becoming an outright dissident and expelled from the psychoanalytic movement. So it was this place that he occupied within psychoanalysis, whereas Ronk, of course, split Jung and so many, and it's not to say that we should judge a person's work just because they stay within psychoanalysis or leave psychoanalysis, that, that, that's a separate question. But if we're within a psychoanalytic tradition, it, it was Ferenczi's position at once inside, but also with a critical eye. And, and of course, then Grodick comes into the story a lot more for me um, and, and all of that. So, so that was the, the way I came to it. And then by 2002, in reading psychoanalysis, I was, was discussing Freud, Ron, Ferenczi, Grodick. I tried to put everybody together in a way and then still kind of, you know, include Ronk in the picture. 
Um, but but my interest had evolved much more into uh, Ferenczi and, and 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 his contribution to to, to psychoanalytic thought. Okay, so my, my following question will be related to what you just said, um, because you have been working extensively not only uh, on Parenzi, uh, as you said, but also on Trank, uh, Gar Grodek, Winnicott, uh, also Elizabeth Severn. So um, I was wondering, um, during, because during the first years uh, in the psychoanalytic movement, Parenzi was one of the closest disciples of Freud. Um, and in your opinion, what or maybe who uh, inspired him to question Freud's theories uh, and his therapeutic me methods? Because we know about Grodek, but, but you also um, wrote about uh, Elizabeth Severn, for example, uh, and her role in it. Okay, that's an interesting question also. Um... I think Ferenczi from the beginning was committed to psychoanalysis as a clinical practice, <clears throat> to psychoanalysis as a therapeutic treatment. And I think ultimately for Freud, while he gave us some important case histories, Freud was not ever primarily interested in psychoanalysis as, as a therapy. And, and, and we know fr from some of the quotations in the diary, some of the things Freud said about patients being a gazindle or a ra rabble and so forth. You know, th th that Freud was developing his system, his theories and, and, and you know, his brilliant work. Um, but but Ferenczi was was from the beginning committed to, to psychoanalysis as a, as a form of therapy. And, and I think was always genuinely seeking to learn from his patients and, and from his clinical work. For, Freud says in the little Hans case, at the end that he learned nothing new from the case. It simply confirmed his theories. That's a sad statement in my opinion. That's, that's early on 1909. And I think if we read Ferenczi, in my view, Ferenczi desperately sought Freud's approval. He, 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 he needed Freud's love. He was in the position, of course, of being, you know, in the early, during the trip to America in 1909, Ferenczi was present, it's extremely important. Uh, but it was Jung who was the, the crown prince and the heir and so forth, right? So, so I think in, in Ferenczi's writings, we, we can see him, you know, trapped in a certain way uh, by his need to idealize Freud and, and to defend Freud um, uh, and, and to subordinate himself, to submit himself to, to the role of the disciple, which was the precondition for gaining Freud's approval in my understanding. Um, and, and he found, you know, co-found IPA. Um, he, he writes to Freud, mutual analysis is nonsense uh, in 1912. Um, that, that, you know, he, he completely agrees with Freud uh, when it comes to the split with Jung. Um, but um, his, his comments, his, his papers are, I think, very frequently uh, implicitly autobiographical comments on his struggle, where he consciously accepts his role as the, as the subordinate disciple, the loyal disciple, even going beyond Freud in a way, in, in his commitment to Freud's worldview while rebelling against this, unconsciously really, I think. Um, and so it's a gradual process that uh, I think probably um, influenced Ferenczi's development, certainly his association with Rank in the 1920s, 
the, their joint work on the development of psychoanalysis, as it's called in English, Entwicklungsziele der Psychoanalyse, um, where they talk much more about experience, reliving, repeating, as well as remembering, and so forth. Right. That that's an important. You know, I, I've written a lot about the 1923-1924. Um, period as a turning point, as many others have recognized, right? Ronk publishes The Trauma of Birth. Um, Ferenczi's Thalassa comes out. Thalassa is actually a work that is really very um, much an, a kind of traditionally Freudian work. And, and Freud and Jones and others saw Thalassa as the summit of Ferenczi's achievement and everything he did after that as a falling off, you know, fr fr from this great height of the Thalassa. But but it's really within the Freudian system completely around the castration complex. Um, but then of course, the, the split between Freud and Rock came and, and, and Ferenczi was on Freud's side completely. But at the same time, in the late mid to late twenties, I think uh, as the conflicts with Freud, you know, the strains in their relationship maybe is a better way to put it, um, um, uh, led Ferenczi to devote himself increasingly to, to his clinical practice um, in Budapest. Um, and I, I've, I've, I've suggested that in the later papers, especially, um, there's an important difference between the public published papers of Ferenczi where he tries very hard to remain loyal to Freud and what we can see him writing in the diary or in other private texts. Um, where he's more forthright in his critiques. So, so I think it was a gradual process um, where, you know, um, to the end, uh, I, I think he, he would have very much wanted it to be different. Um, but he was learning from his patients, from his own practice. And, and I see Ferenc is having had three analysts really Freud, of course, for some six or seven weeks only, you know. Um, then Grodek in a more mutual way, to be sure, but still um, limited. And then, especially with Severn, but with the other patients who challenged him, questioned, forced, you know, led him to, to, to be open to, to their criticisms. Um, that, that's kind of how I see it. So, so there was always that capacity in him um, uh, to, to, to rethink, to question. And, and, and he became increasingly aware, I think, of this um, trap or this, 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 this double bind, as I call it, right? Um, where um, either, according to Freud, if if I'm correct in this this understanding, Freud really said, either you are my disciple, which requires the 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 follower to subordinate and 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 to be in the subservient position, or if you question and disagree about certain things, then you are cast out of psychoanalysis altogether. And, and what was missing in 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 this structure is the possibility of being genuinely independent without being viewed as disobedient, as a rebel. That's an authoritarian structure, in my understanding. That is the tragedy of, of psychoanalysis that we inherited from Freud and that Ferenczi has helped us in large measure to free ourselves from. Yes, and I, I think this perfectly moves us to the uh, to your book, uh, to, the, to your last book um, titled Mutual Ana Analysis. Uh, so in the introduction, uh, you write, uh, quote, for instance, mutual analysis becomes the paradigm from the contemporary shift to a two-person conceptualization of clinical work, just as Freud's self-analysis was paradigmatic for the one-person perspective of classical theory, unquote. Mm -hmm. So what you describe here, uh, in my opinion, is a shift that enables a whole structural 
uh, thinking of psychoanalytic theory and practice. And I would like to ask you about um, Severance, Elizabeth Severance's uh, role in Ferenczi's discovery of mutual analysis. So what does it mean that she took the place of Ferenczi's analysis after Freud and then and Grodek? Did she manage to, to give Ferenczi this sort of uh, openness that he has been searching for, for since the beginning of his collaboration with Freud? Okay. Um, well, you, you're asking a complex question, I think, as, as always. And, and I, I did feel it was a helpful way to conceptualize the mutual analysis experiment uh, as, a para, as, as a two person paradigm, in contrast to, but also in a way, in a complementary fashion to. Freud's self-analysis, which is the received his heroic narrative of, 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 of the origins of psychoanalysis, right? That, that yes, Freud was writing letters to Fleece, who in a way is in the role of the other or the analyst for Freud, but really it was Freud's heroic self-analysis um, that gave birth to psychoanalysis. And I don't think we should discard the role of self-analysis from our thinking or the one person model altogether from our thinking either. I mean, it's always a kind of oscillation where every, or a pendulum, right? Where, where you, you go in one direction and then you take a, uh, you know, a swing in the opposite direction and then you realize you have to kind of re re rediscover and, uh, you know, what was valuable about the original perspective. Um, and, and certainly the depth of Freud's self-analytic revelations and you know um uh, and it's a separate topic but i i do think freud had an affair with his wife's sister minna bernays uh, and, and that's in in the summer of 1900 that's a controversial belief of course but but i think that the the the, the type of writing you see in in his papers up through 1901 you know psychopathology interpretation of dreams on dreams screen memories and so forth that, that there's a very um, that, that there's a very you know specific personal uh, self analytic quality to the writing that makes it of great interest and value, and we can see in in Grodek's book of the It, for example, uh, or in the work of Harry Guntrip, um, who was an important um, colleague of Winnicott and Fairbairn in the British independent tradition. Um, and in Ferenczi's own writings, of course, um, a similar depth of self-analytic reflection um, th that I think we have to continue to cherish and, and find indispensable. It's, it's, you know, when we're engaged with other human beings, we recognize they are other from us. Okay, th that is true. Um, however, the um, other side is the whole concept of the analytic field the, the the recognition that we are not monads, we are not in 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 um, in isolation from each other. Isolation is a tragic outcome, the feeling of isolation. But we are embedded in relation from the beginning of life. So so as Winnicott says, there's no such thing as a baby, because yes, of course, we know the baby exists as a as as a separate being, but the baby cannot exist without the environment, right? Ballant talks about oxygen. We cannot live without air. So, so to understand the individual, we're always understanding the environment on, on, the, on the growth of that person. And therefore, the, the so, you know, sort of relational interpersonal outlook and, and the concept of the analytic field and so forth um, requires us to always think about our mutual impact, or the you know the, the the impossibility of fully disentangling the contributions of each person, and ultimately leads to a kind of group analytic concept, right? Um, and as I've tried to show, for example, um, the the um, community of of people in Budapest and, and, and around Freud in Vienna, 
that, that there's always this kind of interaction. Um, and, and so what's happening in any given analytic diet or in Ferenczi's life or, in, <clears throat> you know, that, that there's always the need for a field theory, um, depending on <clears throat> the level at which we wish, we wish to analyze the phenomena. John Rickman, I think, you know, said we need a one-person model, two-person model, three-person model, a field theory. It all depends what we're analyzing. We can't understand the mother and the baby without looking at the family, however we define the family, but the family is the, is the institution that mediates the transmission of society to, to the individual, to the child. So the family itself must be analyzed in a social context. And, and it's not always a, a, a traditional nuclear family, of course. We understand that much more clearly now, I think, than, than perhaps in the past. Um, so, so Agnes, you, you were asking me about Severn's role in this, I guess, right? <clears throat> I mean, yes. it, you know, I, I didn't sort of undertake this work, uh, in, you know, as a consciously, as a feminist project. Okay. Um, but it has that quality. Um, one, one of the other analysts whom I have been very influenced by and tried to do my part to um, bring into greater prominence is Nina Coulthard uh, in, in the British tradition, whose work I just love, um, slouching toward Bethlehem uh, and other writings. Um, and so, you know, even going back to Ronk, one of the things, and we, we all reinvent our own wheels, right? You know, we, we, we discover something and, and you know, we, you know, our, it's like, we, we can't believe our parents had sex. You know, every generation discovers it for the first time, okay? So, so I read Winnicott, I get excited about Winnicott, but of course, Winnicott died long before I read Winnicott, okay? So, I, you know, others had understood his importance long before I did, but I still felt there was a place to um, bring Winnicott into greater prominence, especially among literary scholars, who had been so influenced by Lacan th th that other psychoanalytic traditions were not appreciated sufficiently. So, so I did a collection, I think back in 1996, um, called Transitional Objects and Potential Spaces, Literary Uses of D.W. Winnicott. So, so, you know, so, so over my career, I've tried, as I've myself found inspiration in different analytic thinkers and writers, to share my enthusiasm with others in hopes they will find some value in them also. <clears throat> and, and with Severn, of course, um, we, we have to give a lot of credit to Christopher Fortune, who in the first collection of Harris and Aaron, excuse me, Christopher Fortune, who, who lives in uh, Vancouver, on Vancouver Island in, in British Columbia, um, had, had, the, had the good fortune, if I may put it that way, okay, to become friends with Elizabeth Severn's daughter, Margaret Severn, <clears throat> who had retired to, um, to Vancouver. And, and it was fortune in his 1920, 1993 essay on RN, um, who really um, brought, uh, what well, we also have to say that Jeffrey Mason in, in his Assault on Truth um, made an important contribution in, in, in bringing Severn out as a person, um, not, not just as RN in the clinical diary as, as the most important patient, um, but, but as, a, as, as a person with a name. Although of course it should be pointed out that the name Elizabeth Severn was not her, 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 her given name, she chose this name, okay? So, so the question of her name is itself a complicated question. Um, and, and so P Fortune wrote a series of, of papers based on his uh, acquaintance with, with Margaret Severn um, that um, helped all of us in the Ferenczi community become more appreciative of her as a person. Um, but, um, for me, what was absolutely transformative 
um, and I, I mentioned this, of course, in my book and in my edition of the, the Discovery of the Self, what was a communication from an independent scholar um, who had been at one of the conferences in Budapest, I think, uh, named Kathleen Miggs. Uh, and if you know Peter Swales, uh, who, who did the groundbreaking work on Freud and Minna, um, a self-taught uh, scholar of psychoanalysis, Kathleen, Kathleen Miggs, I think of as the Peter Swales of the Ferenczi world, okay? Because she was the one who first brought to my attention and was the first to, 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 to propose that the discovery of the self contained disguised case histories of herself and of Ferenczi, and I sus subsequently was able to establish also of her daughter, Margaret. Okay, so, so the realization that Severn in her book published in 33, the culmination of her eight years of analysis with Ferenczi, told what I call the other side of the story. Her experience of her analytic work and of Ferenczi as her own patient immediately allowed me to read her book as the necessary complement in, in this mutual way, okay, that we have the two narratives side by side, inseparable. To, to see, you know, Ferenczi writes about RN uh, and his other patients, but of course, his diary was not intended for publication, right? So Verne's book was published, and we know that Ferenczi read the manuscript. That's very important. He read and approved the manuscript. Um, so he must have known that, that she had written up him and, and, and her her, her, her experience as his analyst, in disguise, of course. But it's also very important to know that everyone in Budapest was aware that they were doing this in the last year, okay? Um, and so the patient's voice, the voice of the patient and of the woman in this case, right? Uh, and, and then, you know, realizing that the Library of Congress um, in the Freud archives has Severn's interview with, with Eisler, uh, and Clara Thompson's interview with Eisler and so forth and so on. And the work of, of, of Billy Brennan, B. William Brennan, absolutely indispensable, who, who identifies all the patients or almost all the patients who are only cited by their you know, initials and, and various pseudonyms and so forth, right? That, that we, Brennan has decoded the clinical diary, right? And so all the pieces began to fit together. And, and then I became extremely interested in Severn in her own right, her story. And of course, Rackman, who became the heir and, and literary executor of Severn through, through a process whereby it was Margaret, the daughter, who had um, what was left of Severn's papers. And it's important to know that tragically, Severn burned her correspondence with Ferenczi. We lost that archive, okay? Um, Eisler was, was hounding Margaret at the end, you know, to come for analysis to him and so forth and so on. And he, he was all concerned about Mason's critique of the so-called seduction theory and all of this. And um, so, so Margaret, um, a distinguished dancer of international reputation, a very, very interesting person, of course. And, and her, I don't know, Agnes, if you want to explore this with me later, but, but the life story of Margaret Severn and the intergenerational transmission of trauma and sexual abuse uh, is extremely fascinating, I think. Um, so I, I really went on, you know, a mission to, to understand Severn better, her two published books, um, uh, her archive, which Rackman, who became her executor through Peter Lipskis, um, who, as it turns out, I tell this story, uh, you know, he was about 50 years younger than Margaret Severn in Vancouver, and they became lovers. 
That's, that's an incredible story. Mar Margaret tells them the bedroom is over there. <laughs> and off they go. Okay, so, so through Margaret to, to Lipskis to Rackman, who, who wrote his book, who, who also had been interested, of course, in Ferenczi for many years, um, uh, then, then wrote his book on Ferenczi, uh, on, on Severn, Elizabeth Severn, The Evil Genius of Psychoanalysis, um, taking Freud's reference to Severn, although Freud does not name her, and it's Jones who gives us this reference to, you know, as, to Severn as the evil genius. And, and I kind of understood in, in my way of telling the story that you see Ferenczi in a way between Freud and Severn, okay, pulled in opposite directions. Um, and, and for Freud, Severn was the one who what was leading Ferenczi astray, okay, most radically. Um, and, and, I, and I show also that Severn met Freud three times. So they knew each other. Okay. Um, although um, when, um, after Ferenczi's death, it's very interesting that Freud is not 100% certain that it's Severn whom he calls this suspect American woman and so forth. And, and I argue in my book um, that Ferenczi increasingly developed what I call a secret life where he did not communicate to Freud the most important things about what he was doing because he knew Freud would not understand. And so there are absolutely, you know, there are only like a couple of references to Severn at the very beginning when, when Ferenczi inherits Severn as a new patient. And, and Severn had had three analysts before Ferenczi. Smith, Eli Jellif, Joseph Ash, and then Ronk for several months when Ronk came to New York. Uh, and, and, and then she had not gotten what she needed from these three analysts, so she comes to Ferenczi, and at the beginning, Ferenczi is, is reporting back to, Ronk, uh, to, to Freud on, on Ronk's technique and so forth, how bad Ronk is, okay, uh, at that point, okay. Uh, but increasingly, um, you, you don't find mention of Severn in, in the letters to Freud. And, and I argue it's not because she was unimportant to Ferenczi, it's because she was extremely important increasingly important, and, and he knew that he could not disclose the full story, at, really, he kept it private. So, so we know that Clara Thompson's uh, sitting on Ferenczi's lap and so forth, Clara Thompson uh, sh shares that um, with um, Freud's patient, um, who, who, okay, um, you're, Agnes, do you remember the patient of uh, Freud's? Um, who, who tells Freud um, uh, about Thompson sitting on Ferenczi's lap. Uh, and then Freud writes the, the letter to Ferenczi about the kissing technique. Um, you know, but, but, but that's not Ferenczi telling Freud. That, that's word getting back to Freud about what Ferenczi was doing. Um, I wish I could come up with the name of that important. Um, e Edith, Jake, uh, e Edith Jackson. Edith Jackson what was the patient of Freud's. And this is, again, the way that the, the analytic field, as we're doing here in this meeting, of course, it, it, it's, it's international and Central European in its essence, right? Um, although the Americans come in um, into that world. Um, so I became very interested in, in Severn in her own right, her story you know, her life story and, and her profound influence on Ferenczi um, and, and beginning to see that, that Ferenczi's legacy is transmitted, especially in the United States, um, uh, through uh, three women, of course, the best known of whom is Clara Thompson. Uh, but then you have Isette de Forest, who, who wrote a book called The Leaven of Love, but uh, she, you know, and then the, the one who was least well known was Severn. Her, her book sold almost no copies. It was barely noticed. Only one review by an anonymous reviewer in the Psychoanalytic Review, um, who who just, you know, trashed the book. Uh, but I became convinced that it was Severn who was the most important and 
you know, transmitter of Ferenczi's legacy, at least in the United States, we have to think about balance and, and, and the United Kingdom and, and the British school as a separate parallel track. Um, but Ferenczi twice credits Severn in his published papers, unlike any of the other people with whom he was working including in the Oxford Congress lecture, the principle of relaxation neocatharsis. So, so it became clear in my view that it was really Severn who understood Ferenczi most profoundly and who gave us in her discovery of the self, um, a much neglected book that had been out of print since 1933. Um, this, this enhancement. And so I say, you know, we have the Ferenczi Renaissance and in my own way, I've tried to contribute to a little Severn Renaissance, if you will, to kind of take it to the next level as we always do. We always discover new things uh, as, as we do this work. Yes, in, in one of my favorite chapters of your uh, last book, uh, Beyond Grodek, you just be beautifully wrote that Severn and Ferenczi, quote, became a twin uh, constellation in the psychoanalytic firmament, uh, unquote. I really like it. It also shows, I think, how, you know, we can think about knowledge um, formation in a relational perspective. I mean, in a relational way that we do not have this heroic vision of one man who created a theory or discovered yeah. a theory, but we have the knowledge that is formed in always in relation with, with somebody. This is really, I think, beautiful. But Thank I would you. like to <laughs> go uh, further um, because in your last book, you, you write about the origins of trauma theory. So I would like to reflect more on, on this trauma theory de uh, developed by Ferenczi and Severn. Uh, why Freud could not have uh, accepted Ferenczi's uh, brilliant confusion of the tongues between the adults and the child. Uh, because in, in your book, you emphasize that in his final years, Freud, uh, quote, was consumed with the question of trauma. And this was inseparable from his continuing battle with Francis Ghost, uh, unquote. So what, what Freud could not or feared to accept in Francis and Severn's trauma theory? OK, well, I have to say I enjoy hearing you read some sentences from my work. I think you have chosen very well. Um, and this, this reference to the twin uh, uh, constellation in the psychoanalytic firmament, right? Uh, at the end of the chapter on Beyond Gradek, I think, uh, part of what I was proposing in that chapter is I think it's been well understood um, thanks to the publication of the Ferenczi Gradek correspondence that Fortune edited uh, that that Grada kind of succeeded Freud and Ferenczi's development. And, and that, that Ferenczi found in Grada a kind of a warmth, um, uh, friendship, uh, mutuality, and they had a certain kind of quasi mutual analytic experience of a sort, right? Um, but I was then proposing that in the same way that we can read in the Ferenczi Grada correspondence, a kind of growing distance between the two of them, not unlike uh, what we see between Ferenczi and Freud, although unlike the Freud Ferenczi letters, Severn is everywhere in the Ferenczi Grada letters, okay? Um, he calls her his countess, his queen, and he talks about seeing her for five hours a day. And I also point out that when they traveled, you know, Ferenczi went on vacation, he would take his entourage of patients, uh, usually, or at least some of them, right? And, and I point out that, that Severn was able to stay in the, the sanatorium of Grodek, whereas Clara Thompson, they were staying out in, in, in Baden-Baden, okay, at a greater distance. So, so, so the privileged role of Severn uh, was clear. Uh, but I suggest that even though we know how Grodek, um, was very much, of course, all about psychosomatic and and um, uh, was, you know, uh, really in a certain way uh, challenging Ferenczi's kind of rationalistic tendencies. I mean, the, and a kind of scientific approach that that Grodek was much more in his own way, kind of um, believer in in the id and the irrational and the value of all of this that Grodek was not really mystical. 
Okay. Uh, and that, that Ferenczi from his early paper on telepathy, pre-analytic paper, and, and Severn in her, her life shared an interest in, in the occult, in, 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 you know, in, in the para, you know, parapsychological, uh, which we can think about how far we want to go along with that, right? Uh, but, but in using that metaphor uh, of, um, uh, that, that of this, you know, of, of Severn and, and Ferenczi, I was kind of saying that the Grotic could not accompany Ferenczi in his ascent to the stars, okay? He couldn't go as far as, as, as Severn did uh, along this path, okay? Um, so, so about the trauma question, right? Um, the, this, the central sort of question here, is the role that we think whatever is, is innate, in, you know, the drive theory versus, versus the role of, of the environment and experience. Um, you know, that, that, that Freud's, in my view, that, that if you read a case such as the Hans case or, or the Dora case, any of them really, we can critique Freud on two grounds fundamentally. One has to do with gender, um, the patriarchal bias and all of this. Um, and the other has to do with what I consider to be his neglect of environmental factors. So, so that he gives us information about the life of his patient, but he doesn't you know, the Dora case, the families, you know, the, the, the exchanging with Herr K, all of this, you know, but, but he still returns ultimately to a theory of innate fantasies and drives and so forth as, as the explanation for, for neurosis. And, and so it's a basic, you know, um, and I, I certainly think we have to acknowledge genetics and temperament and, and innate factors. There's something there that is innate and unquestionably. Okay. Um, we're not blank slates. We are born with certain inherited endowment. And, and some forms of serious mental illness, undoubtedly, in my view, have a biological or neuropsychological, neurochemical dimension to them. However, what we can do in therapy and analysis has above all to do with the effects of experience and what happens when things go wrong in someone's development, when, when the family and the environment is not good enough. This is crucial, okay. And one interesting question is, you know, there are some extreme views, which I do not agree with, but you could basically say that Melanie Klein and Lacan and others would, would in a sense, argue that we are all traumatized, that the human condition is so bleak and so bad th that all we can do is accept the hopelessness of our condition. And, and that's the outcome of a good psychoanalysis that we're split subjects, we cannot heal from this, we have to acknowledge it, and, and end of story. The, the other tradition of relational psychoanalysis, in my view, of self-psychology, of Ferenczi, is that, yes, of course, we acknowledge there's always an unconscious part of our existence, and the idea that we achieve a perfect wholeness of being once and for all is not the case, but there's a big difference between people who are living from the standpoint of a true self or of creativity, of fulfilling their own inner law and you know, spontaneous way of being. If the parents encourage this development and don't try to force the child to become a, an image of their narcissistic projections, right? So, so, so it's for me fundamentally the role of experience and environment that we can work with in analytic therapy. Okay. And therefore, the first thing is that to, to call something a trauma uh, 
means that it's beyond the normal capacity for assimilation. Okay, Winnicott talks about the difference between the way, you know, if the mother is absent from the infant for an X plus Y period of time, and then returns to the infant, the infant can tolerate that absence. If the mother is absent for a prolonged period of time, X plus Y plus Z, it becomes a rupture. It becomes a trauma, a micro trauma in that moment, if you want to call it that, right? And it's more than is tolerable. So, so something happens that, that cannot easily be repaired. Okay. And, and of course, Freud's so-called you know, abandonment of the seduction theory 1897 is the fundamental turning point, which back in my first book, Freud and Oedipus, I saw as most traditional analysts do as the, the great breakthrough, the discovery of psychoanalysis proper, the role of fantasy. And again, I think we should remember there's something of value in this. Freud says there are no indications of reality in the unconscious, right? So in the unconscious, maybe we cannot really do reality testing or, or distinguish what is real and what is hallucinatory. In dreams, dreams are, are, are hallucinations that we experience as real, and that's a good model for the unconscious. However, to call child sexual abuse seduction and, and to think that it is above all and almost exclusively not what the parent or the caretaker does to the child, but the child's spontaneous desire to kill one parent and, and have sex with the other parent that's the origin of neurosis, I think ultimately is mistaken. Ultimately. Okay. Although I have to say, in reading literature, I am currently writing an essay. Oh, do you have to leave? Uh, I'm sorry, but thank you for joining. Okay. Thank you for saying so. See you. Hope to see you. Good luck in Chicago. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on Gottfried's Tristan. Do any of you know this work? a masterpiece of, of Middle High German literature. I have to say that when I read this work, I come back to thinking, well, maybe the Oedipus complex has some truth in it after all. How can I say it's completely wrong? But I, I come over to the view ultimately that it's what we can call trauma, which can, can take many forms fr from single overwhelming events to what are called cumulative traumas or micro traumas, strain trauma, et cetera, um, that derail human development, cause people to suffer unnecessarily. And it can take the form basically of abandonment or neglect, which is the absence of environmental support when we need it, or it can take the form of abuse and intrusiveness, too much stimulation, too much and too little are, are the two basic forms of trauma, right? And, and that's where therapy and analysis can help us heal through some version of corrective emotional experience. And, and one of the cornerstones that I, I build on from, from Ferenczi and from Severn is that if the core of a trauma is an emotional experience, it cannot be healed merely by intellectual insight, although that can be valuable, but there's something in the relationship with the analyst or the therapist that must happen in some form. And, and it can happen paradoxically by how it doesn't happen, but then you have to examine that Okay, that, that becomes the transference, the seeming absence of, of connection that you hope to be able to use to open up 
what what is being how, how that's serving an adaptive or protective function for someone who who feels that she cannot depend on anyone else really. Okay, um, so so it's this basic orientation to the environment experience that, that leads me to a trauma theory. Does that make sense? Um, and and Ferenczi, of course, ultimately in, in his confusion of tongues, but before that, in, in the, the papers from 29 on to 32, is trying to rehabilitate the trauma theory while still kind of preserving the, the you know, what is valuable in, you know, in the traditional theory of Freud. But again, I think in the diary, he's more willing to critique radically the Freudian system than he does in the published papers. Um, and that leads to a different conception of the analytic relationship. So, ther so theory and technique are inseparable, right? The return to trauma theory necessitates a different model of the therapeutic relationship rather than educational and, and detached the analyst observing the patient and interpreting the patient's resistances and so forth. We, we enter into it in a wholly different spirit. This is the crucial thing. And one other point I want to add to this is the concept of dissociation. And I don't know, Agnes, if you had a question specifically on that point, but I, I, but, but I, I, I would say that I much earlier appreciated the importance of the trauma dimension of this, okay? And it was quite late in my work on this project that all of a sudden it hit me, ah, you know, if you have a trauma theory, you must also have a dissociation theory, that those two are also inseparable, okay? Because Freud's Oedipal theory is essentially also a theory of repression that we have innate drives that are unacceptable to conscious thought. Therefore, they encounter the barrier of censorship and so forth, but it's coming from within the individual. And, and repression sort of in its simplest form is a kind of vertical model of the conscious and, and the pre-conscious and the unconscious and the barrier preventing what is unconscious from penetrating into the pre-conscious and therefore to consciousness, right? Um, Whereas trauma, if you think of it in that way, and, and we realize that we're talking about relationships from the beginning, and things go, go wrong in relationships, then it leads to splitting, fragmentation, or dissociation, a different model of the mind. And although it's possible to look at dissociation and repression as somewhat synonymous terms, and in the early papers, like studies on hysteria and such, you know, the, the terms are almost interchangeable. But Freud was very, cons uh, and, and, you know, uh, concerned to separate out psychoanalysis from other theories that were contemporaneous with his, especially Janet. And, and of course, he emphasized that we shouldn't use the word subconscious, we should say unconscious and so forth, right? Um, and, and so it's the idea that a trauma theory is also inevitably a dissociation model of the mind. And Fairbairn is very good on this also, really, okay, that his notion of the splitting of a central ego uh, into, you know, different aspects of the self uh, is, I think, much more convincing, ultimately, um, and part of the trauma theory. And, and Severn understood this from early on in the American tradition and brought this to Ferenczi, I think. Okay. Um, and I point out in my work that um, the later, it's interesting that in his later writing, Ferenczi does not refer to Janet at all, where you would think he would be a necessary point of reference. Um, he, he talks about Breuer and the return to trauma theory, but he doesn't link it to a theory of dissociation uh, in, in, you know, in the tradition of, of Janet and other rivals of Freud. Severn comes out of the American tradition, Morton Prince 
and his work, you know, she already was thinking about this in her first book on psychotherapy, 1913. And I think she influenced Ferenczi also uh, to, to think more profoundly about fragmentation and dissociation. And of course, Ferenczi was experiencing this with Severn also uh, in his own experience of analysis with her, as well as seeing it in his patients. Uh, yes, and, and you write a lot about Janet, about Prince, and also how Severn um, go farther, went farther, sorry, uh, than, than, than Prince, for example. But um, when you uh, said about this experience versus fantasy, um, I was also thinking about the major difference between Freud's system and Ferenczi's system. And in my opinion, there's also difference between experience and theory. What I mean is that, you know, for me, Freud had um, something, maybe a problem with his interpretative drive. So he needed to interpret all. And yeah. for, for me, his big um, so-called great cases, so as, as, as you said, Dora, Hans, uh, Wolfman, uh, and so on, they're like a waltz between himself and the patient. And uh, you know, I see Ferenczi as someone who just broke these walls, you know, yes, yes. in the experience with his patients. So this is a great difference because he did not want to theorize them. You know, this is something, in my opinion, amazing and really revolutionary at that time. Well, I, I think we're having an experience here today, <laughs> right? That's lucky because that means it's alive. Um, yes, I mean, here, here, here's my thought. Um, I, I, I read articles for psychoanalytic journals and was editor, of course, of Imago, American Imago for 10 years. I, I just read a revised version of an essay on Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar for the Psychoanalytic Quarterly. I did not support the publication of the paper when it was first submitted. I still don't think it's a very good paper, but it will probably be published, <laughs> which is fine with me. But the problem I had with the paper, among other things, I mean, here, here's the problem with interdisciplinary work. And I come from you know, the field of English literature and the academy into the world of clinical psychoanalysis. And very often academics who write about psychoanalysis don't understand or have an appreciation of the clinical dimension. They think of psychoanalysis as a form of grand theory, cultural studies. And, and yes, you can view it that way, but, but the essence of psychoanalysis is lost if you don't see it as connected to experience clinical experience and other kinds of life experience. Okay. Conversely, the problem with a lot of analysts when they write about literature or other topics is they don't really have adequate training and understanding of what it means to be a literary scholar. Interdisciplinary work is hard. Okay. Um, but the problem with the paper was the author had certain strongly held opinions influenced by Bion and Klein that I thought became a kind of a priori struck, you know, template that was imposed on the text of Shakespeare's play, rather than being guided by the experience of reading the play and showing how certain theoretical perspectives deepen and illuminate our understanding of the play. And so therefore, in my, in my view, clinical work and literary work or other similar endeavors are very similar because what I call close reading is very much the same as close process listening. The essence is being a skilled, empathic and attentive listener where you cannot say to someone else, I understand you because that is a presumptuous statement that claims you know what someone else feels. All you can do is create the conditions in which someone else can say, yes, I feel 
understood by you. You have gotten what I'm trying to say. And so that is starting with the immediate experience created with the other person as one does when one engages in a dialogue with the text, right? Ideally. And now, of course, it's always reciprocal. You come with your preconceptions that allow you to see certain things, but then you see things that you think are really there. And then you try to communicate to someone else why what you think you see someone else can see and therefore it's real okay uh it's a shared illusion that becomes a reality um so yes i mean as i said freud quotes him you know in, in the little hans case he says you learn nothing new um and, and and so I, I think that it's precisely, and the independent school of British psychoanalysis, I think, shares this idea that we start, you know, we, we can say, yes, we're all share something as human beings that is arguably universal. We, we are also formed, as Eric Fromm would say, you know, with social characters where we have things in common with other people um, who are of a similar social class or, or background to ourselves, but ultimately it's the uniqueness of the individual that for me is primary and of each dyad or each, each experience of a work of art and so forth, right? Um, so Agnes, I think there was something in what you said that I'm still not responding to. Can you repeat your question just so I make sure? I, I've addressed. No, no, no. It was rather a comment. Now, uh, okay, well, do, do, do have I missed something? Because no, I, no, no, no. I think that we can uh, move further if you like to the last uh, questions, right, because right. we will then open the the discussion. Um, so, I would like to go back to Severn for one minute because. Uh, while reading your book, I, I thought that she's like a, in the center of, of it. Uh, of course, there's Ferenc, but also Severn's, Severn is, is a, maybe a real hero um, in your last book. So um, what I want to ask you is, um, do you see any reflections uh, of her, uh, of Severn's ideas um, on the theory and practice uh, in contemporary uh, psychoanalysis in, in United States? Okay, um, well, I don't think that we can say that there's a direct influence because Severn has been virtually unknown uh, until the reprinting of her book, which has, I think, made her more accessible to a wider audience. Um, but if we think of, Ferenzi and Severn as creating something jointly, and we should not exclude the other important people with whom Ferenzi worked. And so it's not only that the two of them specifically, right? But what we can call the um, relational interpersonal tradition, um, the field theorists of psychoanalysis, um, some versions of field theory that I associate with Ferro and some of the Italians, um, um, I have a difficulty with um, because they seem to me to exclude the role of, of real experience too much, okay? Uh, that, the, that the analytic field becomes a kind of dreamscape in which it's all co-constructed in, in fantasy, really, okay? Um, and so I called it not only a field theory, but a film theory, like we're trapped inside the matrix of, of, of a fantasy and there's no place for reality or real experience in, in some versions of field theory, right? But broad, broadly understood the idea of the analytic field as, as co-constructed, uh, as well as the relational interpersonal school more broadly defined, right? Um, which includes for me Eric Fromm, and, and you know I, I greatly admire Donnell Stern, uh, among many others, um, and, and uh, Lou Aaron, of course, my late dear friend, 
uh, Adrian Harris also, you know, and, and the recognition of the importance of the relationship and of, 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 of emotional experience um, of, of some sort of reenactment uh, in, in the analytic process uh, is so broadly shared that um, it's not necessary or possible to trace it always specifically back to a single source anymore, right? We're all swimming in the ocean, in a sense, the same ocean or some, 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 something like that, or, you know, see what I'm saying? So, so I, I think that um, I, I, I'm pleased, uh, th there's a recent article in Psychoanalysis and History um, that um, was of great interest to me. Um, um, let me just see this here. Because it is interesting to begin to see um, direct references to Severn. That, that's, that's very much, you know, a, a desirable thing. Uh, but I, I read an article by a scholar in, in England named John Boyle, published in Psychoanalysis and History, uh, and, and the whole question of telepathy and, and all of this, which we haven't touched on, but, but the degree to which the concept of unconscious communication leads sort of by, by gradual steps to what might seem to be extremely far-fetched ideas of being able to do analysis across the ocean and so forth and so on, right? Um, without ever meeting the person or, you know, um, very mystical. Um, but I think Severn is increasingly uh, seen in her own right as, as, as a co-creator of, of what we think of as Ferenczi's fundamental contributions in his later years. You know, if that principle can be established, that when we name Ferenczi and, and his great late papers and the diary, we're, we're really thinking of Ferenczi and his environment, okay? Uh, and, and in that milieu, Severn plays, I do think, perhaps the most important role. Um, Okay, great. Thank you. Um, many thanks for, for such a My extremely, pleasure. extremely, I think, important and fascinating conversation uh, we've had. Okay, so now, um, if you'd like to ask uh, any questions. Uh, or yes, I would love to hear please, from please others. Who are, and, and Clara, I see you're joining us here. i sorry I could not participate in your Spielrein conference, but I'm very delighted that you're here. It's a pleasure to see all of you. Um, so, so I'd love to hear any thoughts or questions or comments that you may have. If not, I have some additional questions, but maybe, maybe we can. Okay, Mo uh, Monica. So I, I leave the floor. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for your. Thank you for sharing these fascinating ideas on several other things. Well, you presented last week, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I hope there was some continuity between what you and Yuda talked about uh, and what we're talking about. So I'd love to hear from you. Um, I... Uh... I remember when uh, in uh, 2017, uh, James Richter uh, yeah. and uh, analyst of uh, yeah. Sivorn uh, visited the house and architect. Yes. And uh, he, a very uh, old elder man, I don't know if uh, he's alive or not. Uh, yes. No? He was uh, in uh, in the, his uh, middle of uh, ninety, I guess, very very elder. Uh huh. And and uh, he 
he he told how was uh, analyzed by seven yes. in in the late 40s i guess on the I, early 50s I, and I have, uh, yeah yeah you wrote about this yes, i yes. guess yeah he was in analysis <laughs> with her from this is yeah. on page 41 of my book for all of you who already have a copy okay but oh, it's yeah. basically on page 41 yeah we have and, and he presented in nineteen and twenty fifteen in Toronto, um, and and oh, you know it was very exciting uh, to and, meet. And uh, he was uh, he he showed uh, his uh, drawings. Yes, or, art therapy. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So, so he was in analysis with Severn from August nineteen fifty one to January nineteen fifty three, which is also when she gave her interview to Eisler. Okay, during this period in the early fifty. Um, so yes, to, to have yeah. met one of uh, Severn's own patients, the living links, right? <laughs> yeah, it was quite uh, exciting to see this man. And, yes. and he told that uh, Severn uh, made him uh, to draw because he was uh, too inhibited uh, to, to talk. They, they couldn't talk. But uh, Severn made him uh, to express uh, himself in another yeah. way, and yeah. this uh, how one can uh, uh, one one could feel what a kind of uh, mind uh, should have been Severn, mm -hmm. the same experimental one, I guess, yes. like yes. Ferenczi. Yes, just this one, I. I it's a uh, wanted to share. Yes, it's a, it's a it's a lovely observation, and um, mm -hmm. we're used to thinking of Severn primarily as in her role of a patient, right? But I, I would call her a psychoanalyst, really. You know, uh, and mm -hmm. now you know through Jim Ryder, the architect, um, having met someone who was her patient as an adolescent in New York. Yes. And as you say, the use of, of, of art therapy, the drawings, magnificent drawings. Um, and I believe that these are now in the Library of Congress as part of the Severn Archive. Okay, so, so you, you know, they, these, they are- Do you mean this drawing? Yes. Is a part of the, really? Ah. I am pretty sure that, that they are now, you know, in, in the Washington DC. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but the use of these techniques that are often employed in child analysis, of course, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. children and, and, you know, play therapy, um, th that Ferenczi wrote a paper called Child Analysis in the Analysis of Adults. And so yeah. the question is, um, what, how, how can we work most effectively with people for whom verbal you know, communication and, and, and traditional interpretation are not helpful. Well, of course, yeah. Winnicott and, and others, Klein, you know, pioneered um, uh, play therapy um, and, and Winnicott's famous squiggle game where he mm -hmm. and the patient would jointly create drawings that they would, you know, talk about and create meanings together. But I, I, I point out in my book, and I owe this to Brendan also, that um, Severn's interest in art therapy uh, has to do with a seance she participated in with someone named Margaret Naumberg in London um, in 1934. Um, and, and this Margaret Naumberg was a pioneer of art therapy who had founded something called the Walden School in New York which we know Ferenczi visited when he was in New York. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah. so um, and is this in your uh, latest book? Yes, it is. Which you published? Uh huh. Oh, yes. I haven't read it. Yes, fortunately. Yes. Uh, but no, you absolutely. But I'm looking right. forward to read. This is where I talk about <laughs> right and, and Severn's use of this of the drawings, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, oh. and again, there's a complex, you know, way that. This, this originated out of both her interest in Ferenczi's and, and their overlapping connections.
Um, yes, but this was very unique to to hear this um, in a personal discussion. Absolutely, there's no. Yes, I I I, I don't know if any of Jim Ryder's mm -hmm. talks have been recorded. So, so that we could no, watch. No, 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 it wasn't recorded. The drawings are fantastic. And, and, you know, he was, he's a very distinguished man, ar architect in Boston. And so you're very fortunate to have heard him speak in, in the Ferenczi house. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but we haven't recorded, which is a big, big fault. Well, we don't have the technical, uh, uh, you know, yeah, environment to the, the capture help, this. Help with that. Yeah. I wasn't sure I wanted to have this meeting recorded, but I'm glad <coughs> we have. Mm -hmm. So Agnes convinced me that we should do it. So, so, yeah. So this at least we have. Yeah, we have to keep in our mind and share. Yes, we as do. As far as we can. And if I have uh, another uh, small oh. comment, I was very fascinated by the parallelism of uh, close reading and close listening thank you because uh, uh, you you i'm um, hundred percent sure that you know uh, nicola abraham uh, theory on uh, you know uh, on uh, michael babich uh, uh, poem. Okay, the, the specifics of the poem. He, he interpreted the poem as a, as a, as an in a frame of analysis. He told that he he laid the poem as, uh, as on the coach of uh, of the okay. analyst. And yeah. he interpreted yeah. this uh, as a kind of close reading uh, and and close listening to the poem. He told uh, Nicola Abraham the, exactly the same view. As we listen to a poem, is uh, reading and listen to the poem is quite like when when an analyst listen to uh, his uh, or her patient. And yeah. this is very fascinating to read the, the poem like this. And we also have to imagine that the poem reads us, right? Yeah, sure. It, that, it's a that, mutual, mutual yeah, thing. That's the thing, right? Yes. So thank you for sharing. You know, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have another question, maybe? The last one, probably. Okay, so uh, Olivia. Please. Yeah, um, I have a question about the issue of the name of Elizabeth Severn. Uh -huh. You mentioned it was uh, cho chosen, and I wonder why do you perceive it as that unusual? Could you say something more about it? Okay, that's a very interesting and complicated question. Um, It, it to 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 detail the story of her life is is too complex, um, but sh she was born with the name Liotta Loretta Brown. Her married name was Haywood. In in a complex story that I tell, um, she and her husband separated, and her husband, and or his her husband's family really kidnapped their daughter, Margaret, and took Margaret to the farm of the husband's father. So this would have been Margaret's grandfather, where she was molested and abused in a complex reenactment of Severn's experience with her own father. Severn, after a period of agonizing separation from her daughter, did a reverse kidnapping and took the daughter away from the grandparents of her, her husband's father and escaped, ending up in San Antonio, Texas, where she started a new life. And it seems part of the reason 
for her change of name was so that her ex-husband could not find them. That's one explanation, one factor. Okay. Um, th then the question becomes the choice of her name specifically, Elizabeth Severn. Why did she choose this name? Okay. Rackman proposes speculatively that there's a connection to the river Severn in the United Kingdom. The name Elizabeth perhaps sounds like a queen or some kind of you know, regal, very distinguished name. So, so, so Severn certainly was a woman, very formidable woman. You know, she, she had an incredible charisma and presence. Um, and she began using the name Severn and she also claimed to have a PhD, which was certainly not true. She, she became Dr. Elizabeth Severn. So she invented herself, reinvented herself in a way that one could question, you know, the truthfulness of if one wanted to be very critical of her. Um, and of course, the, you know, in the United States, the, the medical profession and then the profession of psychoanalysis uh, was trying to distinguish itself from, from quacks, quackery, people who claim to be doctors, but who don't have proper scientific training and so forth. And so Severn, from this point of view, could be viewed as a quack, as a, as a, as a, as a simply like a fraud in the most negative way. Um, I will point out also a small thing that Severn's name is pronounced with the emphasis on the second syllable, Severn. The river in the United Kingdom is the Severn, okay? Um, however, it's not entirely clear if that's the true explanation for her name. Okay, um, Kathleen or Katie Miggs, whom I credited with having done the important work to identify the disguised case histories in uh, the discovery of the self has proposed that Severn's choice of her name was perhaps due to her relationship with the painter Leon Dabo, a French-born painter, uh, became American, um, who was born in the region of France, Saverne. So, so it's at least possible that, that a, a more convincing explanation for her change of name had to do with a romantic relationship. Um, and when I wrote my book, I had not read, there are several unpublished book manuscripts in the Severn archive, which I either did not have time to or was too lazy to read. I'm not sure which. Okay, but the most interesting of these is a novel called Crystals an autobiographical novel, which I have recently secured a photocopy from the Library of Congress and uh, shared with Katie Miggs and someone else who uh, uh, wrote to me about my book uh, about Severn in Cincinnati. Um, unfortunately, we cannot establish when Severn met Dabo because she had already changed her name by 1910, if perhaps even a little earlier. And it's not, uh, it's not certain that they met prior to that time. So that may or may not be the, the, the re explanation for her choice of name. But Crystal's an autobiographical novel I've considered, should I try to publish that too? Okay, it's 1922, it's before she meets Ferenczi. It's of less interest to psychoanalytic scholars only of interest really to people who are very passionate about Severn. But I, I'm only saying that we don't have an absolutely um, conclusive explanation for why she chose her name, but only that she did. And certainly it was part of her self-creation, uh, you know, um, and, and her negative associations uh, with both her birth family and her, and her married name. That, that she certainly wanted to leave those behind. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
I, okay. I would welcome any other questions or maybe we should, anyone else who has a thought? Well, I've, I've greatly enjoyed this meeting. Thank you, Agnes, for the invitation. Thank you all for joining. No, us. I would like to thank you really. Um, it was a great, great pleasure for me to, to talk with you. And thank you for all the questions also.